Hi, welcome back. In this, the fourth out of five sessions that I'm doing on discount rates in a DCF, I'd like to talk about a practice that I find troubling in the context of discounted cash flow evaluation. While the discount rate is designed to carry going concerned risk in a discounted cash flow evaluation, and that is its only purpose, I all too often find that people want to use the discount rate as the receptacle for all their hopes and fears. What am I talking about? Well, let's suppose you're valuing a really well-managed company or a company with significant competitive advantages, or as value investors like to call it, big moats. I see people trying to use lower discount rates to reflect the quality of the management or how good a company is. Conversely, if they have a badly managed company or a company with very low moats, they feel the urge to use a, to a much higher discount rate to reflect what they tell me is its higher risk. I also see people trying to bring into discount rates concerns that might not belong in there. As an example, when I look at venture capitalists and how they, inv uh, how they value companies, all too often I see discount rates of 50, 60, 65 percent for young startups. I mean, so that makes sense, it's risky, but the risk you're thinking about with a young startup is survival risk, right? And discount rates were really never designed to carry that kind of risk. So in short, people tried to bring into the discount rates all kinds of stuff. And in the process, I think they either end up counting things they shouldn't be counting or double counting things they should be counting. So let's look at the good stuff that people try to put into discount rates. So let's start with an intuitive statement or what sounds intuitive. If a company is well managed and well run, it should be less risky, right? Well, think about it for a moment. Is that true? Well, the answer is actually no, because you can have well-managed risky companies and badly managed safe companies. But even if you have a well-managed safe company, I would argue that the quality of the management is really shown in the cash flows as higher margins, higher returns on capital, better investment choices. The place to show management is in the cash flows, not in the discount rate. And to give you a very simple illustration of why the intuition breaks down, let me give you a contrast of two companies. Company A has high quality managers in place who are aggressive about investing globally, aggressive of going after growth while being discriminating. A tough combination, but they pull it off. So because they're aggressive about going after growth and going after new markets, they have a much higher expected margin. But because they're going after riskier businesses, there's a much wider range across that margin. So basically, it could be as low as 5 or as high as 11. Think about another company in exactly the same business with low-quality managers who are very conservative. They don't want to go past their existing businesses. They have lower margins, subpar margins of 3%. But because they stay in the tried and the true, the range around that margin is much lower, 25 to 3.5%. Clearly, the first company is going to be worth more than the second company. But the first company is actually riskier than the second company because there's more uncertainty about the expected value. So... I think we often mistake a higher expected margin as less risky. It's a variance around that value that drives risk. So we need to separate our quality of management from risk because the two don't go hand, to hand, hand in hand. Now let's think about the bad stuff, the risk that people want to bring into the discount rate. That sounds pretty reasonable, right? After all, the discount rate is supposed to reflect the risk in a company. But if we step back and think about risk, and I've done this categorization before, you can break risk down into buckets. The first differentiation is between estimation risk and economic risk. You're saying, what's the difference? Estimation risk is mistakes you're making because you haven't done your homework, because you haven't collected the data that you could collect. Economic risk, you can do nothing about. So as an example, when you value a Greek company, there's a tremendous amount of economic risk about the future of Greece, about the future of this company that has nothing to do with you not doing your homework. So there's estimation risk versus economic risk. Estimation risk you can make go away by doing more homework, collecting more data. Economic risk is out of your control. You can have micro risk versus macro risk. Let's back up again. If you think about a, about a company like Facebook, the micro risk reflects the risks at the company level, that the online advertising market might see more competition, the management might have a misstep trying to grow. Macro risk comes from outside. If the economy slows, advertising overall will slow. So micro risk relates to the company. Macro risk is coming from outside. And in some companies, it's a macro risk that will dominate, as in commodity companies and cyclical companies. In others, it might be the micro risk. And finally, there is discrete risk versus continuous risk. And let me give you a very simple illustration of the difference. Let's say you're a U.S. company operating in another country. 
you're exposed to exchange rate risk, right? In the first scenario, let's assume you're operating in a country with a fixed exchange rate. So most of the time, you feel no risk because the exchange rate is fixed. But the risk, when it happens, is discrete risk. A devaluation could very quickly knock 40% off your cash flows. In contrast, if the same company operates in Europe, and the euro dollar is a continuously traded instrument, it's continuously exposed to risk. So you can have discrete risk as opposed to continuous risk. You say, why make this differentiation? It is to bring home the fact that discount rate is not designed to carry all kinds of risk. To begin with, a discounted cash flow valuation is a going concern value, right? So the discount rate should reflect only risk that relates it being a going concern, which means that if there's a risk that puts the company's going concern status, you know, that it might not be a going concern anymore, a discount rate might not be the best instrument for reflecting that risk. So discounted cash flow valuation is designed to capture going concern risk. It's also designed to capture risk through the eyes of a marginal investor who, if he or she is diversified, will have a very different perspective on risk than somebody who's not diversified. So if you think about a going concern where the marginal investor is diversified, the discount rate is really designed to capture macro risk that the company faces as a going concern. It's not designed to capture estimation risk. It's not designed to capture non-going concern risk, distress risk, nationalization risk, you know, terrorism risk. And those risks are really not risks that you can show in a discount rate. So in specific, if you look at the classification before, discount, discounted cash flow evaluations are designed more to capture economic risk, specifically macroeconomic risk and continuous risk. Now, we'll talk about how to bring the rest of the risk into the process, but let's think about the risk that we worry about that we try to bring into discount rates and why we should worry about them less. Let's start with estimation risk. When I value a company, I know every single estimate I'm going to make is going to be wrong. Every single one of them. Does it bother me? Well, if I've done my homework and I make my best estimates, I've got to let the chips fall where they might. And as long as these are just mistakes, they don't reflect bias, here's the advantage I have. If I value 20 companies and I am just wrong in each one of the 20 companies, estimation risks should average out. If I'm biased, then all bets are off. So I'd rather be wrong than biased. With company-specific risk, we often feel the urge to bring it into the discount rate. But the reality, again, is if you're a diversified investor, it'll get averaged out across your portfolio. I know it's small consolation when you lose money on a specific company, but you have to take a bigger perspective on these risks and let them pass through. You're saying, what about truncation risk? I think we need to go back to our statistics classes to come up with a better way of dealing with truncation risk. Remember I described a discounted cash flow valuation as a going concern value? When you do a DCF, the best thing to do is actually value the company as if it is going to be a going concern. You're saying, what if it's nationalized? What if it goes, what if it defaults? Here's what I'd suggest you do. Ask yourself two additional questions about truncation risk. What is the chance it can happen? That I could be nationalized, I could default, that terrorism could hit me. Then ask yourself a follow-up question. What, ha what happens if, if that event occurs? In other words, if I get nationalized, if I default, what will I get as an equity investor? And draw in the, a tool that we use in probability and statistics a lot, but not so much in valuation, a decision tree. Going concern probability gives me a DCF valuation. The probability that I'm not a going concern, I get whatever happens if I get nationalized, default, or terrorism hits me. My expected value is a weighted average of those two values. It's a much better way of dealing with truncation risk. You're actually not risk adjusting your value in the sense of lowering your value. You're just taking an expected value. But that is perhaps the best way to deal with regulatory risk, with uh, approval risk, licensing risk, risk where you feel that the risk is more likely to be discrete than continuous. Now, there are some distractions that people throw at you as you start talking about discounted cash flow valuation and discount rates. One is this notion of margin of safety, very widely used tool among value investors. And often I'm asked, why are you using a discount rate to adjust for risk when you can use a margin of safety? I'm not sure what they, what they mean by that, because a margin of safety to me basically means that if I have a value of 50 and I have a margin of safety of 40%, I will not buy the stock if the price 
is greater than 30. I need a 40% difference between my value and my price. But to use the margin of safety, I need to come up with the value first. And to come up with the value, I need a risk-adjusted discount rate. The margin of safety is not an alternative to discount rates. It's an addendum. It's an added way of protecting yourself against risk. The second thing I'm told is if you do your homework enough, there'll be no risk. Really? So if I do my homework enough, I know what a Greek company is going to do in the future or what's going to happen to oil prices in the future. That makes no sense to me. 90% of the risk we face in valuation has nothing to do with you not doing your homework. It comes from the outside. And doing all the homework in the world is not going to make it go away. The third suggestion I'm often given is, why do you screen for risk? What they effectively mean is, want to look for stocks with low price to book ratios, lots of cash. In fact, you can think of the Ben Graham screens as originally more risk screens than cheapness screens. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not a valuation device. It's a pricing device. Nothing wrong with that again, if that's what you want to do. But in valuation, you have no choice but to make this judgment on what belongs where. So let me bring this all together. When you sit down to value an asset or a company, you have lots of dif different risks. For a public company, company-specific risks are risks that you pass through to your investors, assuming they're diversified, they can take care of themselves. Macroeconomic continuous risk you bring into your discount rate, and discrete risk you bring in through probabilities and expected values. If you're a private company, you might want to expand your discount rate to include those micro-risks that you essentially are now exposed to because you're not diversified. You still deal with discrete risk the same way you did with a public company. But this, in a sense, is, is a template that essentially says, put your risk in one place in evaluation. Don't bring it in three or four different places, because then you end up double counting or triple counting risk. So that's effectively what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope you got something out of this.